by surprise. I wasn't <laughs> expecting that completely. Great stuff. Um, I have two quick testimonies for you before we go to the sermon for today. Uh, this last week we had Love His Legs by our kids' church. Incredible, incredible outreach to the community. One of the highlights was uh, one of the days they got to feed 250 people breakfast. Let's give God the glory for that. What's more important is not so much about the food, it's about the food of heaven that they receive. The gospel of Jesus Christ that they received on the day. And we had another team that just came back from Botswana. They were leading a mission team uh, to Botswana. Paul was uh, with them. And uh, they reached out to about 50 people. And eight got saved, three recommitted their lives to the Lord. We give God the glory for that. Amen. God is good. This morning we start a sermon series uh, called Work. Is work a prison or a place of destiny? Is work a prison or a place of destiny? I'm sure some of you already are like, Lord, speak to me. <laughs> I need to hear you clearly here. Am I in shackles or am I where you want me to be? And I have the privilege of sharing the word with Mbali Tandani. She got, she's the fan club here this morning. And uh, I just need to introduce Mbali to you to know who she is. Mbali uh, grew up in East London. We forgive her from coming back, from coming from the same town as Sibiwe. And uh, she uh, studied at UJ uh, Communications and Marketing. Uh, she worked for this amazing company for many years and she ministered to some senior executives in the company. I mean, that's the kind of thing you want to do. With this work series, we're talking about understanding that work is a pulpit for the gospel and a platform for the expression of the gifts and dreams that God has given you. So we will hear in a little bit from Mbali uh, in a moment. Uh, she is currently working as Africa Digital Lead for Unilever. So she gets to travel around Africa. Recently she just came back from Lagos and Ghana, uh, eating some very good food there. That's my favorite food right there, Nigeria plantain. Please open with me Genesis 37. As we do this series on work, we have chosen the story of Joseph as a good example of what it means to hold on to your dreams. Joseph is a good example of someone who, when things were really tough, he held on to his dreams. As you're opening there, I just want to remind you that in this church, we, we see uh, being in the marketplace, in the workplace, as a place where we bring the kingdom of God. We bring God's influence. Just yesterday, I was at Park Run, and as I was running, I noticed I didn't see Pastor Greg. Maybe the Holy Spirit is still to come and uh, minister to him about the importance of going to Park Run. But as I was running at Park Run, I caught up with Vicky. Some of you may know Vicky. And as I'm chatting with Vicky, she tells me she's been given an opportunity to speak at the Actual Science uh, Convention that's coming up in October. And she said that this is an opportunity for her to speak to an industry that is driven by fear and to bring kingdom way of looking yeah. at things. That's how we should think whenever we get these opportunities. I kept on running, I left uh, Vicky behind. I must have been running very fast. <laughs> and I caught up with Sam. Sam Mukorosi, just on Friday, news came out that he's been promoted to be a CEO of a listed company. You are where you are because God has placed you there to bring kingdom influence. And if, if you may be sitting here and you say, I've given up on the dream. God is saying it's time to pick up those dreams again. It's time to pick up those dreams. As we go through the series in the coming four weeks, every day we're going to be ministering and praying for people in different sectors of society. After the service this morning, we're going to pray for those who are in education. We're going to pray for those who are in the health sector. We're also going to pray for those who are looking for, for a job. If you are unemployed, we're going to trust God with you that you will find a job. Amen. Amen. And then next week, we're going to pray for those in business, entrepreneurs, and those in corporate South Africa. You need a lot of, lots of prayers. So we'll be praying and prophesying over you. Genesis 37 verse 1. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed. The land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks of his, uh, with his brothers. Israel loved Joseph more than any of the other sons. Israel is Jacob. Because he had been born to him at his old age. And he had made him a richly ornamented robe for him. 
When his brothers saw that the father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and they could not speak a kind word to him. Just uh, jumping to verse 18, after Joseph has had the dreams, he goes to visit his brothers on the fields. Verse 18 says, But they saw him coming in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. How many of you know the enemy is always after the seed that is in you? Verse 19, Here comes the dreamer. They said to each other, Come now, let's kill him, and throw him into one of the cisterns, and say that a ferocious animal devoured him, and that will see what comes of his dreams. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. So friends, in the few minutes that I want to share with you, I want to just bring your attention to the dreams that God gave Joseph. And Joseph had to hold on to those dreams, like he would hold on to words that God has spoken about you, to prophetic words that God has given you. Some of the words that God has given me, I, I hold on to them daily. I pray over these words and I keep going back to them to remind me who God has called me to be. So when we talk about the prince in preparation, Joseph was about 17 years old when he had these dreams. It took about 13 years before he got to the fulfillment of these dreams. But he held on to the dreams that were given by God. When I look at some of the reasons why his uh, brothers hated him, it is because of the father's love and the father's favor that was on him. It is because of this favor that he didn't do anything to deserve it. But I want to submit this to you, that people will hate you, not because of what you've done, but because of God's favor over your life. People will call you names, just like they call Joseph, here comes the dreamer. They will give, even give you names because of God's ridiculous favor over your life. Not because you've done anything wrong, but because of God's love. People will hate you. These are Joseph's dreams. His first dream was, he saw his sheep rising up and standing up, and other sheep gathered around him and bowed down to him. They were the sheep of his brothers. And his brothers asked him this question. Do you mean that you will rule and reign over us? Who do you think you are? The next dream that he had was the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. Joseph was simply saying that uh, my mother, my father, I saw in a dream and my eleven brothers were bowing down to me. This is the word the Lord gave me. It's a dream that God has given me. I didn't bring it upon myself. Faith is not giving up on your dreams even when you go through challenges. Remember that Joseph had to go through the pit, being thrown into the system. Remember that Joseph was thrown into prison. Remember that Joseph served a Potiphar. Remember that Joseph had to interpret. You know, a lot of us, we want to get to our dreams, but we don't want to go through the season of suffering. We don't want to go through the season of preparation. I just want to submit this to you, that dreams are like seeds. So at the end of the service, there will be seeds for you at the back to pick up, to remind you that dreams are like seeds. So seeds have to be buried before they can bud. Seeds have to go under the ground before they can grow up to become what God wants them to be. And dreams, like seeds, also have to be buried. Dreams have to be surrendered to God. Especially if it's not dreams from God, He'll take them away. But if it's dreams from Him, they will bud. They will surely bud. They will surely grow. And seeds need the sun, they need good soil, and they also need water. And I'm here to say to you this morning, as you pick up those dreams, remember that you need to be connected to the Son of God. Remember that you need a good community around you to help you nurture those dreams. You need people around you that will pray with you, stand with you, and be careful who you share your dreams with. Not everyone will believe with you the things that God has called you to be. Be careful who you share your dreams with. And the one I like the most is dreams needs water. Water is the word of God. Father, we don't want to do things in our own strength. We don't want to do things in our own secure and isolated. We want to be in you. We want to follow your word, your purpose, and your ways. And so I pray that this afternoon, oh God, that we surrender. We surrender our will to you, Jesus. That we cast our crowns before you, Lord God, because nothing is more important than you. 
We speak away distractions. When we just enter in, Father, we found in you always, no matter what season we're going through. And so, Father, be with us now. Come and have it on praises, Lord, as we worship you. Amen. Let's welcome him back. We are really privileged uh, to, to be here. I mean, chances are I might pass out. <laughs> I might throw up. Like, I don't, I don't usually do this. So, and the, you know, the pastors, they pray at a really elegant moment later, but I need to pray right now. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for, for your presence, Lord. And thank you, Father, that, that you are good. That you are good. That you are good. With it. Just sitting within our spirits. That you are good, Father God. And I thank you for even this moment, that even as I speak, may I share your heart, Father God. And I thank you for the hearts that have been prepared for this. And I thank you for the healing that will come to people who this is a word in season four. We love you, Lord. Amen. So... I've had one dream for a really long time, and I wanted to live and work overseas. I prayed about it, you know, I did everything. I even fasted, I did all of the things. Um, prayed, tried many ways to make it happen, and nothing was happening. And one day as I was minding my own business, the Holy Spirit just spoke very, very clearly and said, your dream means more to you than I do. And I stopped and I was like, as the viewer was saying last week, I was like, me, not me, never, not me, that's not me. But he continued and he said, what if I told you it would never happen? What if I said no to this dream of yours? And the anguish and the pain of that moment when he asked that made me realize how much of my identity I had aligned to that dream. You see, a Bali who has worked and has lived over his identity was linked to this, and God was saying no. And that took me on a journey of starting to learn more importantly, surrender your dreams. So have you tested your dreams? Have you tested them? Are they from God? And if he said no to them, would he be enough? So our anchor scripture that we're going to be looking at um, over the next few weeks is Psalms 90 verse 17. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hand. And this becomes important because it shows that it is God who establishes the work of our hands. It's not our striving, it's not our talents, it's not our abilities. It is Him who establishes the work of our hands to make it something worth noting. Make it something remarkable. And the psalmist repeats this. I mean, he says the same thing twice. Why? In the Bible, repetition kind of acts as underlining. You know, when you're like, envy, envy, envy. Yeah. And the previous verse actually spoke about a God who was mighty and powerful, but seemed distant from his people. And this verse is the last one of the chapter, and it really speaks to God saying, it's, it's a plea from the psalmist to say, God, do something through us. Use us. Build with us. So the three things we're going to be looking at um, over this, um, this time that we have is, one, the surrender of dreams, the choice of identity, and a Christ who is enough. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, is my soul. Let the King of my gives him a robe. His father buys him a beautiful robe, and it's the reason why his brothers become jealous of him. He buys him this robe, a gift, and dresses him in this robe. A loving father giving a gift to his son. And this robe actually becomes symbolic of significance being given, identity, affirmation, being given to him, and it's no coincidence that Joseph's dreams come after this moment. You see, Joseph was able to dreaming in order to, to 
stand with firmness and the freedom of the identity that God has given him and is able to dream. We dream from a place of significance. We don't dream in order to gain significance. So you fast forward with uh, Joseph's story and his father sends him out to look for uh, his brothers. He doesn't find them where they are. He finds them somewhere else. And as he's coming, they see him. And like Pastor Sai was saying, they say, here comes the dreamer. And as he's coming, they plan their attack and they say, hey, look, first, we're going to kill him. Nah, too messy. We're going to throw him in the pit. What happens after that? Let's sell him. Let's just make a quick buck. Let's sell this guy off into, into slavery. And guess what they do as they're about to put him in the pit? They remove the coat. Significance and identity is stripped at that moment. Isn't that what the enemy does? As we're about to be put in the place of our enslavement, in the place of our imprisonment, all of a sudden, identity is stripped. And the question that is asked, who are you? Who are you? And who is this God that you say you serve? What will be your response in that moment that asks you, who are you? And whose are you? And some of you have had people especially in the workplace, try to define you, try to tell you to stay in your lane, to stay in your place. And there's been words spoken, hurtful words, that have been spoken over you, injustice that you've experienced in the workplace that has caused you to play small. You play small, you play in the background, because something in the environment told you that who you are is not enough, that you need to be some other person, so you withdraw, or you change yourself in order to fit, in order to make it, in order to just exist in the space and try to thrive. But you found yourself in a pit not of your own creation. All of a sudden, nothing makes sense. So what do you do? When where you are, and the dreams that God has given you, don't match up. How do you continue to trust God? When what you are seeing, where you are right now in your life, and the things that he's spoken over you, they don't match. How do you respond? So over a year ago, a lot was happening in my life, thriving in the workplace. I was about to be promoted to, um, to be the youngest member of the senior management team. Okay? Okay? I'd been accepted into an MBA program that God had specifically told me to apply for, um, I was almost to dream of my wedding. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Where were you when I was having a vivid dream about my wedding? It was a Joseph multicolored dream coat kind of dream. Come on, somebody. I was about to be a success story. Huh? FBA senior management wedding. Huh? Everything, everything. <laughs> And all of a sudden, everything stopped. <coughs> a day before my promotion was to be effective, I was told it was no longer happening. Oh. Few people decided that it wasn't a good decision. I was rejected for the scholarship of the MBA program that I'd been accepted to. Got offered a job at some other company, and I was like, yes, Jesus, I can leave this place that doesn't see me, that doesn't see my full value, and God said, no, you're not leaving. My car was broken into twice in that particular period. All of a sudden, I found myself in a pit not of my own creation. The words that God had spoken and where I found myself didn't match up. Injustice hurts. Mm -hmm. When you feel like what Greg was saying, when a situation feels unfair, it hurts. Being in limbo hurts. When you feel like what God has said and where you are, there's no traction, nothing's moving, nothing's happening. It hurts. There's confusion. There's hopelessness. You know, you stop and you say, God, but I heard you. You spoke. I listened to you. I obeyed. But yet, I find myself here. Someone in this house once said something that was quite powerful. You know, it becomes important in the moments where you find yourself in difficult seasons. Words that you hold on to in the moment, and they are important because it is in that water 
that you get to have the anchors of who God is and what he is saying over you despite what you're looking at. So Carol, I just wrote her as Carol because I know her, she's not like some person. This is Carol Gosman. Said something a few years ago which became really important to me. Love is comfort, but God says love is growth. For me to believe that the things that he has placed in me will happen with ease is gross naivety. Guess what? Exactly because it was spoken is why it's going to be contended for. Exactly because you've received the same prophetic word 15 times, that is exactly the playground test your face. Joseph was a leader. 
even though he wasn't existing yet in the place of his promise. He was a leader in his family, he fetched his brothers, um, he went you know, the extra mile to where they, they, they were. He was a leader in part of his house, and we later learned that he was a leader in prison as well. What does this mean? Our Greg said something that was quite powerful to me years and years ago. Greg, this word changed my life. He was you a slave in part of his house, he was in prison, or he was leading all of Egypt. He was his purpose. Which means that when we choose to live out our godly identity, when we choose to partner with God and say, Lord, I'm going to be who you have called me to be, that opens up the space for us to live our purpose. We're obsessed with saying, Lord, what's my purpose? Where should I be? But if you are your purpose, guess what that means? It means that you get to choose to be that person, whether you're in a pit, you're in a prison, or in your space of promise. It is completely up to you, which means, unfortunately, that whether work is prison or a place of destiny is completely up to you. So in my season of landing up in a pit, I did not create. I made a decision. Your promise still stands, 
But I'm going to need you to stay here in the place of your enslavement for another 70 years. Yes, you're in the back here. Yeah? But I'm going to need you to stay here. And then, not just to stay here, I'm going to need you to raise your families here, um, to build houses, and then I'm going to need you to pray for the prosperity of the city because as it prospers, so will you. But Lord, the promise, no, 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 the promise still stands, but I need you to trust me. Why? Verse 11, because I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to trust you, plans to give you hope and a future. So that's awkward because this scripture that we love so much isn't about a space where God is affirming you to say, this is what I'm going to do for your promise. It's saying here in the place of your enslavement, in the place where you don't want to be, in the place where I have not called you, I am going to do things for you right here Amen. in this moment. May we sing it in our spirits that God has a plan for this season that we're in, pit or prison. May we not be so obsessed with the future that we miss what God wants to do in this season. So for me, I'm really thankful for my season in the pit, actually. I would really go back if it was to know God in this new way, because I'm thankful that he was a loving enough God to break me gracefully. But trust me, as I was going through it, I didn't see grace, I didn't see beauty. I mean, I was just like, I got bored. It's easier for us to want purpose linked to comfort. And as I made the decision to move my spirit out of the pit, I have to decide what I would declare with my mind. Now that I've made a decision, what changes? What do I do? Have you ever had to declare truth that you don't believe? You have to say certain things that as you're saying it, the inner you is like, mm. okay, all right, sounds nice.
I really sense that God wanted to do something in a lot of people who have had hurt come to them based on the workplace. There's been things that have sought to break you. There's been things that have sought to give you a new definition, a new identity outside of what God says. And you've experienced injustice. You've experienced hurt in certain spaces and things that have sought to tell you who you are. And today, we're believing that God will restore. God will restore the truth of who he says you are. Restore dreams that have been killed. Restore dreams that have been stored. Dreams we've believed, they're clearly not for me. And we're also going to pray for people who feel, honestly feel like they're in limbo. You feel like nothing is happening. You're praying, you're seeking God, you're running after him. But it seems like you're just not getting to where God has spoken. So if you're either of those people, if you can just put your hand up and we're going to be praying and trusting God to intervene in this moment. If you have felt like work has hurt you in some space.